Welcome to another Bible study. Brothers and sisters, I greet you well in the wonderful and precious name of our great Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So very good uh, for us to be together again. Good to greet those right here in Jamaica, those over there in the US, Canada, the UK, Germany, the islands, wherever you are. It is always a pleasure to have us together in Bible study. Um, we have, over the past weeks, uh, been looking at the broad subject of relationships, and I believe we have shared so much. Uh, some of us have taken steps to adjust how we approach the whole matter the whole business of our marriage relationship and I really want to encourage all the married couples I really want us to know that what we are in I want to remind us I want to reinforce all the things that we have said it is important for us to recognize that what we are in what we have become a part of the the two of us that have now come together and become one. I really, really would encourage us to look good, look closely, look deeply, review the things that have been said uh, from the outset so that we can, where we need to, make the necessary adjustments so that we can align ourselves with how God intended for us to operate within the arena of marriage. It is a great event. It is a great encounter. It is a great experience. It has its blessings. It has its uptimes. And it will have its downtime. But I believe that under God, every one of us can make the necessary adjustments so that we can seamlessly uh, move in the word of God, move in our togetherness. And when I say seamless, I don't mean in a perfect way because it will never be perfect. Just as our, our relationship and our walk with God, we as individuals cannot yet be perfect, but we are striving for that. So I want to really encourage all the saints that are married, all those who are not yet married, but it is in the back of your mind and you're anticipating your time when it comes. It is very important that we take the time out, that we assess and analyze and, and be clear in our minds the things that are involved so that when we get into it, then the expectations and the reality won't be too far off and as such we will be closer to experiencing the the positive and powerful relationship of being together in marriage and so I encourage us again push at it work at it being married staying married enjoying our relationship Brothers and sisters, it requires work. It requires effort. It requires our doing things as individuals in the relationship to make it happen, to make it grow, to keep it alive. We must understand that. It cannot function on autopilot. It cannot function on its own. So there has to be input. It is a dynamic affair in that there are moving parts in our relationship. And we therefore must understand this, understand, brothers and sisters, the dynamics and move to do what we must. Remember we said it at some point earlier that we, if the relationship is going to move and if it is going to be something that we embrace and accept and look out to have it moving to from one level to another. 
we must recognize that we do not live for ourselves, but for our spouse. Yes, husbands, consider that you're doing a lot of the things that you do for your wife. For your wife. Wives, a lot of the things that you're doing, many times you might want to move to acquire or accomplish something personal. And sometimes we have to put off our personal achievement for the benefit of our spouse. And so it goes both ways. But when we live for the other, when we make sacrifice for the other, when we do things to make sure that our spouses are happy and comfortable, you would be surprised to know how far that goes in, in filling your cup of happiness and contentment. Just moving to satisfy our spouse, our husband, or our wives. And that is very important, a very important concept, a very important principle. The, the scripture tells us it is more blessed to give than to receive. And yet when we give, automatically an overflow, something comes back to us. It happens in the regular course of life. Brothers and sisters, the very thing happens even in our marriage relationship. When we give and give and then stop demanding so much and consider to give more, give of ourselves, give in terms of sacrifice, give in terms of time. When we do that, husband for wife and wife for husband, we would be amazed at what it does on the inside. The satisfaction that comes with giving it is a normal, natural phenomenon. Some people uh, just never experience that kind of joy simply because we are selfish and we are not accustomed to giving, even if it is uh, sacrificial giving, even if it means expending ourselves. And yet, this is what relationships require. This is what makes it tick. This is what allows it to flourish. This is what causes it to move on. And it is important that we understand that, that we grasp that, that we embrace that, brothers and sisters, and that we move to ensure that our togetherness, yes, is as best as it can be. Now, I want us to, tonight to move into an area of relationship that is a vital, of vital importance. Yes, we know that it is important to love each other. Husbands, love your wives. Other scriptures tell that the elderly women, that they teach the younger ones to love their own husbands, to love their children. And so we have, we understand the crucial, critical aspect of love in a relationship. We are not called to love when the person does the right thing. We are called to love irrespective of, so that that love is unconditional, right? God did not say, husband, love your wives if they can cook well, or love, husbands, love your wives if they do this well. Wives, be respectful to your husband if he is a nice person. Wives, be in submission to your husband if he picks up this and do that and put things in. You would be surprised at how the Bible puts it. So without any conditions attached, husbands, love your wives. Wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. No strings attached. It is a hard pill to swallow, but something is behind it. And when it is done, because it is the word of God, we cannot, brothers and sisters, go wrong. And so I encourage us, um, again, to watch the word, be close to the word, understand that we must align ourselves to the word of God. There were days gone by when the word meant everything to a child of God. And we are in a, an era, we are in a, a season 
We are in a, an environment, a time when the word does not carry the weight that it once carried. The impact in the lives of individuals that it once had. And therefore, it is easier for whatever reason now, it seems to be so easy to put the word aside and say, I am going to do this and I am going to do that and I am uncomfortable with this and I am uncomfortable with that and I will go how I feel. I will do what makes me happy. I will do what elevates me and gives me a sense of belonging and acceptance. And if I don't have that, I have every right to do and to take any action in my best interest. That is not how the word of God presents it to us that we revolve in marriage. That is not the word of God. The word of God insists that we follow a certain path. Now, having started a couple of weeks ago and having looked at some principles and outline some things which are Bible and are true and are deep and they are very meaningful. We looked at the concept of covenant and we showed that the marriage is a covenant relationship. And we looked at a number of things. These things are Bible. These things are real. These things we must pursue because they are in the word of God and we have to align ourselves accordingly. But it can easily come across as we teach on this subject, as we present in this area. It can easily come across that God sets these things oblivious of how rough my husband is or how uncaring my wife is or how my husband just have, has no interest in me, or my wife would do anything for anybody else and she'd cook the best dish for a visitor, but for me, it doesn't matter. And therefore, when the Bible says, husband, love your wives, God seemingly was oblivious to the fact that my wife is uncaring, my wife does not regard me, and therefore that could not relate to my situation and her that I must love her because I cannot love her under those circumstances. But can I tell us that there is nothing that can ever happen to us that God is unaware of. And all of us, would have things that we would want to put on the table somewhere along the line. Oh, I wish that my wife was like this, or oh, I wish that my husband was like this, and I wish it was not how it is now. Or we all have things that we probably be, would want to put on the table to express the issue that we may have. Yes, we all would have something that we want to change and we want to be better. Many have already done that and it is becoming better and very good. The fact is, while God has instructed us and we ought to walk in the word and follow the principles and don't go outside of the things that is clearly outlined, husbands and wives must understand that there is a responsibility placed on us, and we see it in different spaces in the book, that yes, we are in this thing together, and it is expected to work. But if it is going to work, do not just rest on a pillow and say, well, I am going to be how I want to be. I am going to operate how I always have operated because the Bible says, husband love your wives and pastor say it is unconditional so even if I don't play my role if I don't get up and do anything for him or for her so be it because I'm going to love me whether I like it or not or she's going to have to respect me 
whether she likes what I do or not. And that is a totally wrong attitude to continue in, brother, sister, if the thing is going to work. My, I always wonder, why continue in something that is uncomfortable and, 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 and cold and harsh when it does not have to be that way? Wouldn't it be easier, since you can't just get up and move like that, wouldn't it be easier to draw back and to sit down and talk? And if both of you cannot talk, to, to have a third party, so to speak, so that you can be open and you can be independent in terms of views being expressed to you, wouldn't it be better to try something new? And different, so that you have a chance, an opportunity to make your lot better. I am inviting married people everywhere to look at how we have been approaching this thing. Yes, the Bible says, husband, love your wife. Yes, the Bible says, wives, be in subjection to your own husband. Yes, the Bible makes these things clear. And the principles have been outlined and we have looked at a couple of them and so forth. But just to think that I am going to be me no matter what. And she's bound to respect me because the Bible says it. Uh, or he's bound to love me because the Bible requires it. It, it, we are looking many times at this thing without understanding and recognizing that we have a responsibility to each other and we have a role to play in making this thing palatable, in making this thing uh, attractive, in making the relationship workable. We both have a role to play. And that husband or that wife who thinks and decides that I am going to be me no matter what. And let the chips fall where they may. But this is me and I am unmovable, unchanging, like God. You are unmovable and you are unchanging. And he's going to have to live with me this way. And she's going to have to live with me this way. You're contributing, brothers and sisters, if I might say it bluntly, to misery in your relationship. None of us are built to the extent where we cannot make adjustments to our way and our approach to doing things. We are flexible beings. We are adaptable. Yes, you are. And there is potential to make changes and adjustments under adverse conditions, under different circumstances. And for anybody to believe that he's going to have to take me like this or she's going to have to live with me like this for the rest, no matter how, that it is that I am cold or callous or uncalculating or don't care, a so mistake. That is a wrong approach. And we must be open to make changes and adjustments if the thing is going to work. It would be wicked of a person to continue down a path that leads only to destruction and decide that they will not change because you are going to spite that man or you are going to spite that woman. That is wickedness. That is absolutely unchristian-like. And it is one of the things that we had said before, and it is very important. Do not forget, we are first Christians. You don't go marry to that person that is un unsaved. You don't go marry to that man, that woman that is unsaved, don't know God, don't know the word, and you are saved. And you are saying, well, it's a man, and there's a shortage of men, or there's a shortage of, as you might call it in your term, women that are 
uh, of your caliber or there's a and so anybody that come first that look like them fit the bill i am going to move no do not do that we set ourselves up for future disaster and the disaster usually down the line is always worse than whatever it is you think you're missing out on no so always take time brothers and sisters to do it right when eve was brought to adam adam already had a relationship with god adam was in the midst of the garden where the presence of god dwelt and it was in that environment that the relationship got together and consummated in the presence of God. It is important to do it right, to start it right. You must be in the presence of God. And so I say to husbands and I say to wives tonight, by way of reminder, we are first Christians. Let the Christian principle prevail. Let our Christianity stand out above and beyond who we want to be as men. So we might say, we are this, you are first a Christian. I am like this, I am first a Christian. And the Christian principles must be our guiding light. And the principles of the Christian is developed and expanded from the word of God. Do not forget that, brothers and sisters. And so, having said that, and I know that none of us want to remain in marriages that are caustic, in relationships that are toxic, in, in, in an environment where you can't flourish or you can't breathe none of us want that and therefore the little things that we have been teaching and exchanging over the last couple of weeks i want to urge us don't think that i pick on anybody don't think that i have heard something because i hear a whole lot so it is not anything that I might have heard one away and, and I'm therefore picking on anybody. No, no, no. We are talking straight from the book. And we have not shown to give outline and to give examples from the Bible as it relates to relationship and how things unfolded over the years and, and, and with different persons. And we looked at Abigail and we looked at Sarah Yes, we looked at Eve. The principles are there. I want us to take this thing seriously. Don't let the series come to an end. And all that we did was listen and say, yes, I didn't know this. And I didn't know that. I learned something new. This is not about learning something new only. This is about applying the things, brothers and sisters, and living them so that our lot will be better. Yes? Now, I have observed, I have read, I have seen surveys, and I recognize that there is a survey that outlines some things as it relates to marriages in general that cause them to disintegrate to deteriorate that caused them to go on the rocks and to be smashed up as studies were done and those studies were done at the time out of the united states and the sample was in the united states but later on similar studies were done uh, across europe and other parts of the world and the results seem to be very similar so that there are things that contribute to the demise of relationships around the globe a relationship a marriage 
usually does not come to an end because one morning a husband get up and say, you know, boy, this morning I just feel that, you know, you're not the person for me. Or a wife just gets up and say, you know, we had a good time up to yesterday, but this morning the way I'm feeling, I just think it is all over. Call it a day. No, it doesn't happen like that. In the same way, brothers and sisters, our relationship with God, nobody gets up one morning and say, I no longer want to walk with the Lord. And then we just backslide. No, it is a process. A backsliding heart, a seed that have walked out of the presence of God today. The seed of backsliding started weeks and months and possibly years before. When that person walks out on a Wednesday like today, it means that that was the culmination of weeks or months or years of planning and wondering and counting the cost and looking and seeing how to do it. It is years of neglecting the word. It is months of neglecting the word. It could be weeks of neglecting the word. It is a time where the, the neglect of prayer and things that are spiritual, it has all come to a bump. And then they walk out of the presence of God. But nobody gets up and just walk out of the presence of God overnight and say, I just feel this way. Backsliding starts from the heart long before the action is executed. I want us to know that. It is the same thing in relationships. Nobody just get up one morning and walk. It is a process where things start to deteriorate. It continues to deteriorate. It is not uh, attended to. It is not cauterized. Nothing is done to stop it. And folks just leave it to unfold. Sometimes they talk. But then when advice, for example, might be given, they don't pursue the advice. They continue. Because for whatever reason, they just can't seem to follow the Christian principle. And then it breaks down. And then the thing, uh, everybody move away. And the thing comes to a point where the donkey sit down. It is a process. And so the studies were done, and each of them reflected uh, end results, reflected uh, conclusions that pointed to a number of things that cause marriages to disintegrate. And it is important, therefore, brothers and sisters, that we examine some of these things, because if we don't, and the statistic shows that these are the things that squash and, 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 and oppress and totally destroy relationships. It is important that we have understanding. You remember some weeks ago we talked about the aspect of relationship. And, and, and God, through the, prof, through the apostle, said, Husbands, we must deal with our wives with understanding treating them, dealing with them as the weaker vessel, understanding that they are the weaker vessels, but deal with them with understanding so that our prayers be not hindered. It is therefore important that if we are going to understand the workings of relationships, the workings of this institution called marriage, we must understand some things some things that you and I have taken for granted over time. We must take the time out and understand, understand clearly these things because they impact upon our relationships. And many of us act naive and act like we, we just don't know ourselves and we're just reading Bible and, and, and singing songs and, 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 and preaching word or, or whatever we do and carrying on totally oblivious to the fact that some of the very things that we do destroy, mess up, paint ugly, 
an institution that God put up that should be a beauty. We lack understanding of some basic fundamental things. And it doesn't matter that we are married for, for 10 years or 20. The length of time I have found means nothing. Because I am seeing folks now, after 40 years, husband and wife get up and decide to move on. Children are now big, so the things that they were hiding and covering up, uh, you know, because of children and so forth, now the children big and gone. Don't need to cover up and hide anymore. Don't need to, you, you know, put on faces anymore. But that ought not to be. We should not have faces in the first place. So many of us are in relationships and we are just going through the motion at a time when we could easily, and pardon me by saying easily, but easily move to do some things in an attempt to fix what is a toxic relationship. It can be fixed. It can be adjusted. It can get together. And all that it takes is a mind for two persons to get to talking because you are Christian people. There is a scripture that I did not write down. I did not make note of it, but it just flashed across my mind as I'm speaking. Because, you know, we're teaching, you know, but sometimes we divert a little bit. And it is a scripture where, I think it's in the book of Luke. We could probably search for it. I'd ask the producers to search for it. Um, where this particular Lord loan his servant some money and saying, pay me back now. And he couldn't find the money to pay the man. And the man said, okay, man, we're going to put you in the jail, debtor's jail, until you find the money and pay me, you know. And the man plead with his Lord. And the Lord said, all right, all right, hear what happened. Understand, you're under pressure. I'm going to forgive you that debt. And the man said, thank you. And he left. The same man who left, he had a little servant guy who did something for him too who the guy was supposed to pay him, and his payment became past due. And he asked him, give me the money that you have for me. The man said, Jesus, listen to me. I'm going to come talk with you. I don't have it right now. He said, hold on, man. <laughs> you know, I hear that from you. You know, you owe me, and I need it now. And the man begged with him and pleaded with him. You know what this man that was just forgiven did? took his servant who couldn't find it and put him in debt as jail. In fact, I want us to read it together. And I'm going to ask us to turn to, say, Matthew chapter 18. I want us to read it together. And I'm going to ask that we put it on the screen because I want us to read it, St. Matthew chapter 18 from about verse 24. And it is very significant. And I, I want to inject this for a particular reason. Let us read it together. St. Matthew chapter number 18, and we take it from about verse 23. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents but for as much as he had not to pay his lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had so no this is serious the man was going to be sold no doubt into slavery his wife was going to be sold his children, and so they could all go to different places because the man just want back his money. So whoever buy them, however far separated the purchases are, so be it. He was interested only 
in recovering, recouping his funds. And all that he had, so not just his, himself and then his wife and then his children, but if he had a house, furniture, whatever, all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down. So notice how bad the situation was. It couldn't be any worse. Yet as bad as it was, and the man had a real genuine case to recover his money. But then the servant fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will repay thee all. In other words, he was begging for time. He must say, please don't do this. Please don't sell me into slavery because I have a family, a wife and children. Please not sell my wife. Please not sell my children who came from out of my land. I beg you, Lord, I, I just give me time and I will pay you everything. But listen to verse 27. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Is a whole heap of money. He would have had for that gentleman, you know, to the extent that he to, to pay it, he would have had to sell him the man who borrowed it, him wife who never have nothing to do with it, his children who were far from it, then everything else that he had, it is clear that what he took, what he borrowed from the Lord was a mammoth, massive amount of debt. Yes? So he did a lot. He was burdened down. It was heavy. It was a whole lot. But he went to the Lord and said, have mercy. So after the Lord had mercy on him and said, look here, forgive him of the debt. Loose him and set the man free. Look what happened now, brothers and sisters. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. You realize how much he owed the Lord? 10,000 talents. Look what this little man owed him. No, 100 penny or 100 pence. Look what the man now did. He laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet, just like how him fell down at the, the, the master's feet. This one know that who him, the little 100 pence, fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Notice, you know, is the same word this servant used to him that he used to the, the, the Lord that he borrowed the 10,000 talent from. The same word, the same request, the same plea for mercy. And him grabbed him by the throat. And here is verse 30. And he would not, in other words, him said, no, 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 no. Me want me money. I need the 100 pence. I don't care what you're going through. The Bible says he would not but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. Cast the man in a prison. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord, that is the one now at the top who did lend him the big money, they told him all that was done. Then his Lord after that, he had called him and said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgive thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant even as I had pity on thee? And the Lord was wroth, or he was angry, and delivered him to the tormentors 
till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly father do unto you if ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Brothers and sisters, I really wanted us to segue a little bit and read the scripture together because it speaks eloquently to a condition that prevail and persist among Christians and in the case that we have in front of us that we are speaking about people that are married. If we are married and we are husbands and wives, we are still brothers and sisters in Christ. If we are married and we live in the same house or in separate houses, we are still children of God and we are going to be brought under the umbrella of this scripture because everyone from our hearts are to forgive his brother their trespasses. It is therefore untenable married people for us to say I will not forgive him or I will not forgive her. It can be done only if we decide that we will not go back to the Almighty for him to forgive us. Any day we fail to forgive our brother, we fail to forgive our sister, and then expect that when we sin, we go to God and say, God, have mercy on me while we will not have mercy on those that did us less than what we did to God and yet expect him to forgive us. We are in the same boat as this servant. And what happened to the servant that we just read about is going to befall us. I don't care what your husband did to you. I don't care what your wife did to you that caused you to be separate, that caused you to be at this place where you have lost it for him or you have lost it for her. Our Christian instinct and principle must chip in at some point so that we can move to have dialogue and revamp what is a bad and caustic situation. Somebody or both parties were responsible for it being where it is right now. And I say that without fear. One or both are responsible for the thing being where it is at now. If you know yourself and you know that you are responsible, be a man, be a woman, take the step and start the process of the difficult climb up the mountain. But the process must begin. Your Christianity depends on it. And Matthew chapter 18, those verses that we have just read, must be read again, over and over and over again. And there are no exceptions to this rule. There are none. What are you going to say? God, it's ten times I told her about this thing. God, it's 20 times she have done it. God, it's five years now he is doing this thing. And I've spoken to him in these five years. It 
is now over. Yet you are married for 20 years, sorry, to Jesus. You're a child of God for 20 years. And after 20 years, some of the same sins that you did in year one, you're doing now. And still going back to him and say, Lord, forgive me. And you know what him do? Him forgive you. If after 20 years he can be forgiving you of some of those ground zero things, how is it that you cannot forgive your wife within three years or five years because they did it or she did it 20 times, 10 times, 30 times? You can't take no more, but you're giving him more 20 years? Hello, I want us to know that we better wake up to what... I believe that a lot of persons who parade about as Christian leaders are just parading. Yes? And they give folks the impression that Christianity is an easy breeze. Of course it's not difficult once you're walking with the Lord. But they give folks the impression that you can do anything and live any way and live anyhow and still just when the time comes, you're going to be ushered off into heaven. I want us to understand that there are folks that are giving people a raw deal. They present Christianity as a little washed up, sapsy movement that you can do anything, anyhow, contrary to how it was presented by the founder and the apostles that he chose and sent to deliver this word. When we read the writings of the apostles in the first century and they urge us to be vigilant and they urge us to take our salvation seriously and they urge us to make our calling and our election sure, when we look at the apostle John writing in the book of Revelation, rehearsing the words of Jesus, say, you church over there, you better take stock or else I'm going to come and take your candlestick out of its place. We, we understand that the, the, this thing is serious, although it is lovely. This thing is deep and it requires our 100% as we pursue Christ. Follow me as I follow Christ. The apostle said that when we look at the things that the apostle outlined and require that we shun, that we put aside, in our pursuit for righteousness and living for Jesus. What we see parading now on the television for people that say that they are Christian, it is a farce. And this thing, what people are telling you that you can't live anyway and then you're going to make it anyhow. And, and if anything even go wrong when you're on your deathbed, just say, Lord, forgive me. It's a farce because some folks when die in their sleep and won't be able to say, God, forgive me. Some folks are going to die in motor vehicle accidents and won't be able to say, God, forgive me. So it is better we understand the seriousness of the hour, the seriousness of the moment, and move to set our houses in order now. While our minds and our faculties and our limbs are intact and we are able to reason and so for those who take refuge in lies that many present over the airways we are presenting it to, to us from bible if you don't forgive your brother and your sister don't expect your heavenly father to forgive you bible not going around no bush not covering it up for nobody it goes for me, it goes for every leader, it goes for every saint. And if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. It is the word of God. We better practice to forgive and we better move at that. Otherwise, we are sealing our own death warrant. So while we talk nicely, we want us to talk seriously also and to present the facts balanced. It is a beautiful salvation and marriage is a beautiful experience. But at the same time, we need to understand that as Christians, we must live as Christians. And the principles are there. Forgive so that you be forgiven.
That's Bible. So, husband, if you decide that she has committed the unpardonable sin, the Bible says he that blasphemes against the Holy Ghost, that's probably the only thing there that will not be forgiven of men. You are now saying that she has done that or worse. Be careful, you man. You are saying, wife, that he has committed the un unpardonable sin. And it is sin enough for you because you are now the God. It might be something that he has done wrong that has incensed you. That might not even be a sin. But as far as you are concerned, it is enough to banish him forever. Shall not be forgiven. And therefore, this thing is over. I will never forgive him. I will never forgive her. I don't know who it is that is advising you. I don't know who it is that is giving you words from the wise. I don't know which book it is that they are quoting from. But take my little advice. And take the quotations that I give you from the Bible, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives. And try, let us try our best to walk in a certain light, in a certain way. It is very, very, very important. I want us to understand that. Do not write it off. La when we met the last time, which was week before la last, we spoke about it last week. Uh, Deacon Minister Bailey went through communication very profoundly. Uh, but when we spoke a uh, week before, we made mention, and it is very, very, very important, we outline that except for the cause of adultery, then there is no basis for us to just pull up stump and go. Let us work it out. Now, having said all of this, I come back to what we were on. The research that was done, brothers and sisters, the research that was done that indicated a couple of things that were at the heart of the destruction of marriages, relationships. It outlined that there are about six or seven elements, critical elements, that were the major cause of the failures in the marriage relationships. There were more, but these were the major ones. Infidelity. And the Bible spoke about that. So we can easily understand that. In-laws, when they get involved, and the Bible tells us, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife, a nucleus, a new nucleus, a new family structure. And in-laws are important and crucial and is a part of the togetherness. But you'd be surprised of the damage that can come. But we're not focusing on that at all today. But just to point out that the study showed that this was one of the causes. So infidelity, in-laws being involved, then communication, which Elder spoke about last week. It also highlighted money. Children, sex and sexuality, and then the whole business of respect and disrespect and, you know, all of those things. But at the top of the list were about two or three. And the top two or three 
there is one that I will pull out of the top three to focus on now. And within the top three, there is one that is called money. I'll pull that one out so that we can put some things into perspective and understand how crucial it is for us to know how serious it is when it comes to money in relationships. The Bible tells us in Luke chapter 14, and we are going to put it up on the screen for us, Luke chapter 14, verses 28 to 30. It is important that we understand how crucial money is in marriage. Most of us underestimate, most of us see our situations come to a bump because of money. And you're embarrassed to tell anybody that you're at loggerheads with your husband or with your wife over money matters. But you don't need to be. Because the fact is, if we do not address and address properly this issue of money, then we are going to forever have a situation where institutions of marriage keep on going down for something that can be addressed. It is a mindset that has caused this thing to go on and on, unattended and therefore unabated, and is causing destruction and mayhem in relationships because we do not understand how important it is, and when we don't deal with it, how dangerous and how damaging it is. Folks have, t have tension and stress in their relationship because of money. We distrust each other. Money. Now it sounds bad. Husbands don't like their wives again because they believe that the wife uh, is hiding money over here. Or wives distrust the husband because they hear that they have a secret account over there. Money. The wife comes into the house and buy a new what not, television, or some other fancy stuff at a time when she told him that there was no money. And so the distrust is there and say, how can this be purchased at a time when we are so broke? Something is wrong. And money, folks just don't understand how crucial that element in a marriage is. And we do this to the detriment of our togetherness. The scripture, let's put it on the screen, because it speaks to a simple, simple phenomenon. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he have sufficient to finish it? Right? Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish it. This man began to build and was not able to finish at all. It is important. It is important, brothers and sisters, husbands and wives, to count the cost. But if we are going to count the cost, and this is the principle, counting the cost, essentially means to look at your money 
budget and see what you have. That's what this episode was portraying. You've got to check to see what it is going to cost to build the tower. All the cement, all the steel, all the sand, all the gravel, to pay the architect, to pay the engineer, the this, the that, and then you're going to put it all together. What does that tell us, brothers and sisters? It tells us the counting of the cost here is simply portraying that if you're going to put a tower up, if you're going to undertake something to build a house, to keep a marriage going, because marriage has automatically entrenched in it, building things together, doing things together, building a home, building a this, buying a car, sending the children to, to school and later on to what It all incorporates these things. And what Jesus, what, what this parable there says there, count the cost, itemize the thing, see what it costs and see that you have enough money. Otherwise, you're going to start and can't finish it and people going to laugh. So the essence, the portrayal here is that we have a budget that we know what we're working with, that we know what we're coming up against. This is Bible. So again, we are seeing something right out in the Bible, jumping out at us, that if we are going to build, and remember we said it at the start, you know, in this relationship called marriage, we are building. So we build a house, and the house can represent what? A family. You remember we talk about the house of David and the house of Saul. What all oh, you get a house, you build a house. But at the same time, when it spoke about the house of David, it wasn't speaking about the, 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 the physical structure that David and his family lived in. The house of David was speaking about his family. The house of Saul was speaking about this Saul's family, his offspring. It said the house of David got stronger and stronger and the house of Saul got weaker and weaker. The family. And so when he's talking about building here again and counting the cost, we are saying that the family is building also and the family must count the cost. In other words, we are going to itemize, see what our living is going to cost us as it is now our living as it relates to projects that we are going to undertake, our living as it relates to school for the children when they come, our living as it relates to all that we plan. No, it has a cost. But then, to spend the money, we must first understand what we have coming in. And therefore, the portrayal, the principle of what we just read is that once we itemize and we know what is coming and then we know what we are, we are earning, then we can put it together and we might find that when we earn $100, the thing that we were planning for is $200. So guess what? Make we shift something and cut some things and change some things so that what we are earning, if it's $100, then we will make the things that we want fall in line with what we earn. Otherwise, there are going to be stresses and tensions and all kind of maladies that put our marriages under stress and strain. How are we going to properly budget? I find it very difficult, and we are teaching, we are talking now, so we have set the background. We have established the context. The scripture in Luke 14 just told us to count the cost if we are going to build something. We are building a relationship now. So we are going to count the cost. What is it that we come together with? When a man and a woman gets together in marriage, and they hide their income from each other. It is a tragedy 
and a travesty. How can the two become one and you expect to live together, plan together, work together, and you earn $50 and your wife doesn't know? And you earn $50 and your husband doesn't know? So therefore, you are both living double standard, double lives, because you have your thing over here hiding, and you have your thing over here hiding, and yet you are expecting to build together. It will not work. It cannot work. If you can trust somebody with your money, with outlining to them what you earn, it, it, it means this is somebody that you trust and you have confidence in highly. If you find that you cannot tell your wife how much you earn, you don't trust her. And that's a fact. If you find that you can you're afraid to tell your husband how much you earn. It means there is something about him that you don't trust. You don't want him to have that information. And therefore, I will not tell him. You, there is a problem of trust already. Forget about all the other things. Money makes friends. And we all know money breaks friends. There is something about money. That we need to understand. Money answereth all things. And we know that that is Bible. So it is important. If we have it, we can accomplish a lot. We can achieve a lot. But then the love of money is the root of all evil. And we have to be careful how we love people. To the extent that we are willing to cause our God-given God breathed relationship to suffer and possibly be damaged, disintegrate, and make it mash up. But me not tell her how much money me work because she going this and she go. Me not care, make it mash up. He will never know how much I earn. We will have a problem of mistrust and distrust if the basic outlining of our total income cannot be discussed. We didn't even say bring it together yet. We just said discuss. Some folks don't even tell. And, and, and I find it more difficult for the man in this situation simply because, you know, husbands generally are seen and were set up to be the caretakers of the home, the breadwinners of the home. And I want us to understand that that basic, basic function has not changed. So that, and we will come later on, because some, we have a situation now where we, husbands and wives work, and they're income together take care of certain things and so the, the, the burden of certain things is not there on him alone however fundamentally men ought to ensure that their family is being taken care of I find it disheartening and we're talking and we're teaching and we, are, we, we look at some scriptures I find it very disheartening when a couple cannot sit and together say we earn a hundred dollars. Husband earn fifty, wife earn fifty, or the husband earn sixty and the wife earn forty, or the wife earn sixty and the husband earn forty. I find it very difficult to accept, and I'm going to submit to you and be very upfront, very blatant, to say that something is wrong with that kind of arrangement. If we are going to build, we must first count the cost, budget. 
and we must know what we have as a couple. Any other approach is single, is one-sided, is lopsided, and it is not tenable. It is not going to work and work as it should. We need to be together. We are one. The twain has become one, and God established that. And one mean as we plan, we have one plan. We have one purpose. We have one building going up. We have one tower that we are building. And notice, we are building the tower. Even if the husband gets up as the man, the head of the house, and starts to do something, your wife was given to you as a helpmeet. That is to make the union complete. And so once you're married, there is a completion. There is the oneness. And then the oneness is complete because she sets in to make up for that lack that was there that God decided to take a rib out of the man and set up this woman and then put her back to make the two in one and to complete the wholeness so that her being there is for the completeness of the union. So husband and wife is building together. Therefore, the dreams must be our dream, our house, our plan, our children, our accomplishment, accomplishment, our goals. That is how it ought to be perceived and that is how it ought to be pursued. If we do it singly, we are pulling apart the completeness that God put in place. If we do it singly, we are decimating something that was to remain together and be planned together. I submit to our saints, to our married people, that we need to take another look at how we operate together with money. No husband should hide their money from their wives. It is bad, it is reckless, and it is, it is just evil. No husbands should know that their wives don't have it. And I just cannot see how we can live apart. That because a husband work and a wife work, I don't know what my wife earn. I don't know what my husband earn. So we just say, you buy the bread and, you buy, and I buy the butter. You pay the light and me pay the water. You buy the soap and me buy the rag. And so after we buy the soap and the rag, the bread and the butter, the light and the water, then I have my money and pinch both fear. And sometimes, let us say that the wife earns less for argument's sake, and she runs out of money, and she, she reach her work and cannot even buy lunch. And let us say that husband, him works so much, and him can put on money in his account, and then at, at, at work, how can it be that a man is at work and he's having his lunch and eating a sumptuous lunch. And he don't even know if his wife eats at work. And she might be there and asking her friend for a piece of her lunch or a little bit of her lunch. And you are at work and you are eating sumptuously and your wife do have nothing. And you have to wait until you go home because at home dinner will be there. But it is the dinner for that day because we cut and we paste and we, 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 we pinch to make it happen. So she won't eat really until she reach home. And you're comfortable with that as a man and a woman, a husband and wife. Something is wrong with that picture. And I stand here this evening to say that must not be. And no husband should be such a wimp. No husband 
should be so cold and callous that you don't care if your wife doesn't eat and you eat. Any husband that is like that is a worthless husband. And I can side with any wife to call that man worthless. If you cannot provide for your household, yes, you're worse than an infidel. And that is Bible. And I want you to, I, I, I feel that I should, any man, any man and every man should take that scripture and let it saturate into his being. No, I'm not saying that a man is always going to have money and going, no, no. Because when we come together as husband and wife and when we plan together and when we put it together, there are going to be times when things are low. Don't misunderstand and misquote the scripture. So when the Bible says that we must take care of our family, men, and make sure that they are okay, there are times that we are working, there are times that we are slaving, there are times that we do all overtime, and sometimes there's a shortage. Yes, of course we go broke. Of course we run out of money sometimes. But no wife is going to turn around when there is nothing to eat a day or two days. No wife is going to turn around and say you're worse than an infidel when they know that you're a hard worker. And it's just that we, when we put everything together, we run out before the end of the month. That happens to many folks from time to time. That does not make you an infidel and you care for them, and you go out of your way for them. No, that's not what we are talking. But we are talking about men who have it. We are talking about men who can put it together. We are talking about men who decide that they're going to save, and especially if my wife work, and I, worse, I don't know what she's getting, and we assume that she have a whole lot, when maybe she does not. And we hoard and hold on to what we have. And cause the family to suffer. Our basic responsibility as men. Is to see that our families thrive. And strive. Yes. And we become infidels. An infidel is someone who denies a particular religion. Especially the religion that is dominant in his area. He's called an infidel. Paul was talking to Christians now. And if he used the term, he was saying that you're not fit to be called a Christian. You're worse than, than an infidel. You're not fit to be called somebody in the faith. And I'm saying to those men, men, and let me talk to men again. Because sometimes to the men, sometimes to the ladies. A man that does not take care of his family when you have the means and the resources you are an infidel you are not a part of the faith it doesn't make sense you run up and down yes and and jump and skip and shout and then you go home and you don't know you see dinner at the house and you're a working man and you see dinner at the house and you don't know how it got there and you don't ask and you don't care you're not a man you're not a husband you're an infidel. You're not a Christian. When you come to church, you're just putting on a show. And church is anywhere I'm talking. And I know I'm talking to people here in Jamaica and people overseas. So I'm talking generally. If we as men have our children and we don't take care of them as a saved person. Yes. As a saved person, you are an embarrassment to the faith. If we don't take care of our families as a saved person, we are an embarrassment to the faith, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Worse than an infidel, we must take care of our families. And... You know, I don't want ladies to feel that I am saying that 
uh, your husband, you are just his responsibility, because some ladies don't want to hear that. They're not comfortable with that, because they, they know that they have what it is to contribute, even if it is not money per se, but they have their worth and they have their contribution to make to the marriage and to the relationship to make it happen. And that is true. Some men have the mentality that ladies are just ladies. All they do is want your money. And so I am now married, you're a Christian man, and we still have the mentality out in the world where ladies just want our money. So we, we get married and we come into the church and we are Christian men in church with a wife and with children now. And we work and we, and we work $100 and give our wives 10 and say, take care of the house with that. Because it's a mentality out in the world. Oh, make them go find it. Because ladies are like that. They just want. Let us not come into the house of God with those worldly mentalities. The Bible from Old Testament times coming around showed us that as men, we are responsible for our families. We started out with that already. So we must have a mindset as men, yes, that we take care of our families. We take care of our wives. We take care of our children. Forget the fact at this point that wives work too, because I'm coming to that. Don't worry. But I'm talking to the basic fundamental responsibility that has not changed. Things have changed in society from then till now. And we have seen adjustments, which we will address. But fundamentally, a man is the breadwinner. A man is the head of the house. A man is the, 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 the one that makes the family work, that caused everything to rotate. He is the head of the wife, of the family, even as Christ is the head of the church. And we have said that over and over again. So that I want us as men to understand that responsibility and to recognize that we take care of our wives and our children. And I'm going to tell you something, because the argument can easily come, but we both work now, and that is true. And that is why any relationship that is going to be wholesome, that is going to be working, must take into consideration that this is now our money. This is what we have earned. And in the same way, our wife now goes out and have to work to help to support and supplement the income so that the man's responsibility can be taken care of, the new society, it is the same way that she having gone out in this way to support and to make it happen so that the man's responsibility to take care of the houses can be fully accomplished. It is in the same way men must understand that we have to assist also so that their responsibility in the home can be taken care of. It is symbiotic. So you both go out to take care of the economic realities. When you come in, you both are tired. Do the same to take care of the household realities. It is a trade-off that is necessary. The fundamental principles of leadership would not have changed, but the economic realities, though they have changed, we can still make it happen. And all that it requires is understanding and knowledge. And that is what we are getting. And, and then move to make the necessary adjustments. It is important. Now, the Bible said, and I'm going to, I'm going to show something. And this is, it's simple, very simplistic, but still I believe it is very real. The Bible tells us, and I want us to know, you know, and we're going to show the worth of ladies, because there's the, the, this mindset in men that ladies only want money. And if a lady, once you get married, we get married, you know, so we can achieve certain things. But hello, you work, your money is yours. I work, my money is mine. No, no, no. 
it, it doesn't happen that way. No, 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 it doesn't. The Bible tells us, for this cause shall a man leave his mother and his father and cleave. So he's going to go get his wife. So he leaves his mother and his father, the man, and then he cleaves to his wife. Notice it is the man that leaves father. Father that leaves father. It didn't say that the wife leave mother and father. Father being the dominant one because he's the, the breadwinner and the source. But the man leaves mother and father and then he gets his wife. The word father is from the Hebrew Abba. And it means source. So while they're in their individual places, the source of the house hold and taking care of it is the Abba, the father. He's the source. So he ensures that food is in the house. He ensures that things are together so that his family thrive. So Abba, that Hebrew word that we call father, means source so the man is going to move from his mother and his father his father meaning source and he now becomes his own source he takes the wife away from her mother and father and she's brought to him he now becomes her source because he took her away from her source. So he was supposed to voluntarily leave his source to establish himself so that he can become the source, the father, the Abba, for the wife that he took away from her because she had a source and he took her from her father and mother. Cleaving to her, he now assumes the responsibility of source. You know, that's why I, 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 I hear my wife call me daddy. What? No, daddy. I'm not her daddy. I'm her husband. But she called me daddy sometimes, many times. I have heard Pastor Grizzle, Sister Grizzle, call Pastor Grizzle daddy. I have heard many wives call their husbands daddy. But it's not them father. It's them husband. But it just comes for whatever reason. It seemed to come out, but we would be surprised because that word Abba means source. And without knowing it sometimes, you would be surprised to know that wives recognize their husbands as their source. And that's why even if a wife work, even if a wife work, you would be surprised to know that she still wants to receive something of her husband. To receive something from the hand of her husband. He is like her daddy, her source, her Abba. Believe me, husbands, when we say it is good to look out for, to take care of, and to support as best as you are able and can, your wife. And you might be a husband that your salary is small in comparison to your wife. So she earned more than me, and she earned 10 times more than me. I don't need to buy her nothing. Yes, you do. Because you took her from her source, and although she's generating money, there is something that is there that she wants to receive from her husband. Because you're her husband, and she still recognize you as such, and as that kind of human source. I want us to see it. So the man leave his mother and father, and establish himself as a source. Take her from her source. You now become her source. And I know husbands, or I've heard about them, not even $1,000. Not even perfume. What kind of... I don't know what is happening. But it happened. And it, it has to be wrong. And 
in teaching, I am saying, men, we need to pull our sockets up. We need to be supportive of our wives. And even if our salaries are below theirs, they are our wives. And they will say, Abba. And it is not the money and the amount of it, but just to show that I care for you and I want to take care of you. And it might be a, a gift every time or a special lunch every time, different from what, how far yours can go in terms of monetary input into the structure. But you have got to have something there for her to know that you care enough to still want to take care of her and the family, even with your limited resource. Yes, even with your limited resource. And I want us to understand that. Jesus required us to take on his name. Those that take on the name have put on Christ. And once we have the name of Jesus, it shows what? Ownership. Not in any derogatory way, but it shows ownership. And that he has responsibility for us. He therefore guides us. He therefore makes a way for us. He, he, he is our sustainer. He is our protector. He is our provider. Because we are his. But you, you, you have, and, and that is, that all comes under or becoming saints and taking on his name. There is something powerful about the name, as we all know. That's a study all by itself. And the name shows full embrace. You belong to me. You are mine. The name, if you look at name coming from Old Testament times until now, we see the power in names. We see that it signifies a lot. It shows a lot. It shows ownership, your mind. And we have just said that as it relates to Jesus Christ. We put on his name. We belong to him. He takes care of us. And he shows how much he loves and takes care of us. I want us to observe. Look at the custom the Hebrew custom, when husbands and wives get together and it has carried over into other societies. Have you ever noticed that the wife, for whatever reason, takes the husband's name? So his name is on her. So my wife was Erica Harris. But as soon as we got married, she became Erica Daly. Now it is not it is not suggesting that I own her in that derogatory way. But it is suggesting that she is mine, all mine. So in a beautiful way, but she being mine comes with a price, a great responsibility. Whether she works millions, whether she does business and gets small amounts or whether she doesn't work at all. I have a responsibility because she belonged to me and my name is over her. How can your name be over this person and you don't care if they eat? You don't care if they're sick and, and, and can't go to, to get medical attention? What kind of men and then we claim to be in the church. I think we ought to draw back, reassess, and understand. And this is talking about money. Yes, money. So we are going to have to spend, and we are going to have to take care of, and we are going to have to make sure that our family is okay. And it is a responsibility us men. Now, what about the couple where both parties work? We must understand that although the husband is the head of the house, 
the unit is a single unit. The wife came to complete and complement him so that the twin is now one. The complementary function is such that what they do comes together. Did you know that in Proverbs chapter 30, the Bible, 30, 31, sorry, the Bible speaks of the virtuous woman? As it goes through, it, it describes her. And remember now, this is being written in Old Testament times, way back at a time when the men are the dominant force, the men are responsible for everything based on how it was laid out. The men knew their responsibility and were living their responsibility. Yet, look at how the Bible describes this woman who is married and she is described as virtuous. Let us turn to verse 16. Proverbs 31 and verse 16. We'll just go and read probably two verses, 16 to 18, three verses, so that we can ju just have a glimpse of this woman who is married to this man. This man is supporting her. Yet, this lady can do a lot. I want us to know that even if your wife is not working, men, couple, there is still a lot that can be contributed to the relationship, even if you don't have an eight to five job. And for men to think that if, if your wife is taking care of the children for the time being and want to zoom in on that to make sure that they have a certain footing, you, can, you don't need to turn on them to say that, look, everybody else is working. Let us sit and let us look at our family setting. Let us look at our financing and finances and let us see how we can make this thing happen. It is about us. And when we understand, so you are working man and you're taking care of the family and your wife, whether she's working or not, let us look at how much a woman, a wife can contribute to the relationship. Yes, irrespective of our position at any point in time. Verse 16. Let's read. And this is talking about that lady, that virtuous woman. She consider it a field and buy it. it. Hmm, that's, that's, that's very significant because maybe she wasn't even working. How will she get money from to buy it? The very husband that she has might have provided that fund. Did you know that some men work a whole heap of money and squander it? It is many, in many instances, the wives, and this is not saying that men don't know what they're doing and wives know what they're doing. No, this is showing the complementary aspect of being married. And so one might have a strength in one thing, the other has a strength in the other thing, and they complement and build each other. So whether she had the money of her own or she got the money from her husband, guess what? She consider it a feel. She does an assessment. She makes a, a, a calculated move and she buy the feel. And then read on. With the fruit of her hands, she planted a vineyard. Now, a vineyard is something that persons would engage in. Not to look at, vine, at grape growing or whatever it is that is in the vineyard, but as a business venture. So this is saying that this wife, not only is she spending the money properly and she invests in real estate and then turn the real estate investment into a business venture now because with her own hands, the fruit of her hands, she plant a vineyard that is a business venture. With the fruit of her hand, she plant a vineyard. She girded up her lion with strength and strengthens her arms. Yes, and she perceiveth that her merchandise is good. So hold on. So she plant a vineyard and she start to trade. 
she get merchandise, probably the fruit from the vineyard or other things that she look at and she saw that her merchandise is good so she understands and she gets involved in trading. Hello, she's working with and complementing and supporting and making whole and one relationship with she and her husband because the husband she knows because this is a wife from back then and she recognizes the headship of her husband and the husband understands his responsibility and is taking care of her but she still makes herself valuable the good wife the 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 what you call this woman the virtuous woman she has something to offer to the home she has something to offer to the relationship don't bash her and think that she has no worth don't bash her and think that she has no contribution to make as simple as any woman might appear any wife every single wife has something to contribute and many men are at a disadvantage today because they believe that they know it all and they can do it all and their wife has no worth and has no value and can contribute nothing to the relationship that is wrong and that is a lie and every wife can push to become the virtuous woman the virtuous wife she perceiveth that her merchandise is good her candle goeth not out by night so guess what happened now she's a businesswoman she does real estate she does trading she stay up at night sometime to get things going so that she can make the thing work she lays her hand to the spindle and her hands hold the distaff that is important she stretches out, out her hand to the poor she's a giver she's concerned that is something sometimes men are cool and callous and they'll see somebody wanting something and say go and go work a lady look at her she stretches out her hand to the poor she remembers that person that don't have it she stretches out of her hands to the needy and she helps she's not afraid of the snow for her household for all her households are clothed with scarlet hello she completes the man she makes sure that everybody have on top notch clothes she makes sure so them look good even if it is simple things she sets up in a way whether she do it on her own or she gets someone to do it she is running the house in a professional way and she is lending and supporting Supporting her husband. She maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Now, brothers and sisters, this is a woman of old. This is a woman that many would say, hello, or many men is saying of ladies, that they can't do anything no I want every man to take a second look at their wives all of us look again some wives are able to flourish because their husbands recognize their worth and their value and go out of their way to help them to reach and accomplish certain things because they have the potential they have it they were given it by almighty god men we must work together with our wives understand that we have a role and the ultimate responsibility over our household but understand that when we have a dollar and share it and open it with our wives we are not taking our money and throwing it into a pit we are allowing her like the virtuous woman to consider a field and bite because we probably would have taken the money and squandered it and i'm not saying that is the case sometimes it is the reverse and this is the point that i'm making but if it is the reverse it makes my point we having been married we are now in the building process 
together. And we must therefore count the costs together and do the budget together and make the thing happen together. And that is why I am against so much. And it cannot be and be right that a husband hides what he has and a wife hides what she has and then we say we want to build it will not be completed the building that you are hoping to achieve will not come to fruition and even if something happens and something comes together you're not going to be happy in that final product. No, you will not. Husbands and wives come together. Your money, your love, your time, how you communicate, all of that come together to make you one. All of that comes together to complement the union. Now, even if you have different accounts, because that's another issue with some folks refusing and unwilling to share accounts. But even if you have different accounts, just to accommodate you, if you earn $100 men, if you earn $100 women, husband, wife, you must both know it. And this is what we have. And even if they're in different accounts, this is what we have. And these are our expenses. And we must work to agree how they are going to be met. And if there are surpluses, this is what we have left. So this is what we can build with. That is the basic fundamental building block of togetherness with our finances. We are going to budget and it is our money. And if we buy the furniture, it is our furniture. No wife should take down the television and carry it around a corner and say, it's all right, you never buy nothing last week. Let me take down the TV because it's my money buy it. That is wrong. No husband should plug out the fridge and say, all right, you never do this for me? It's all right. That's cool. Nobody now drink no water in here and plug out the fridge. My money buy it. That is wickedness. That is divisiveness. That is two separate people. You are not one. And any wife or any husband anywhere that you say the TV is mine, and the, the fridge is yours, and the, 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 what do you call it? Microwave is mine, and the toaster is yours. And if anything goes wrong, we draw it in one side. That's a fragmented, non-workable, crazy relationship. Get rid of it. Get rid of it and practice to share. Share information about your money. Share information as you plan and as you budget. It is our life. It is our children. It is going to be our home. It is our television. It is our fridge. It is our savings. It is our life. That is not done. It is going to be a problem. I absolutely guarantee you. And, 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 and men... Take the lead. Ladies, support and be one with your husband when he takes the lead. We have some questions that we can't do them tonight because the time is up. So we stop here. Money, answer it, all things. The love of money is the root of all evil, however. 
Don't love money so much that you're hiding it from your spouse. Because if them find out, them go and want this and want that. That is a lie. That is a bad mentality for any man to have of his wife or for any wife to have of her husband. And if it is there, come let us have a talk. We can fix it, you know. Some things we can fix. Some things we can streamline. Some things we can sort out. Some things we can work around. Yes? But it will be a perennial disaster if that aspect of your relationship is not brought together and brought together quickly. And so I urge all of us, let's put it together, let's budget, let's reassess how we deal with money. It is not separate, we are together. And if you can trust your husband and, or your wife with your money, you can trust them with your life. We need to break down the walls and get this part healed and going as we continue on the subject of relationships, a biblical perspective. We're talking about money, we're teaching about money, and I want us to continue along that vein. Let's do it, no man, and make the thing happen. God bless you. In the name of the Lord, we're finished tonight. God's willing, next week we continue. But I, it, I, I really, really, really feel a burden and feel convicted and convinced that men, women, husband's wife, do an assessment again. Relook at how you treat with your understanding of money. Or you plan together, or you work together, or you hide things from each other, or you allow people to tell you, put on something in case and leave you so that you sow a seed in the mind that one of you are going to leave each other. And so once that is there, there is an issue. Your money is yours. Work together. Make it happen. God bless you. Next week, God's willing, same time, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before your presence again. We thank you for another night in Bible study. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to see some of these things. And I pray that you will help us as we see them, as we are moved by them, as we become convicted and convinced. Mighty God, I pray that you will help us to make the move, to take the steps that will see us moving from one level to a higher, better level in our relationships. I pray for the people of God. I pray for those who are struggling in their relationships. I pray for those who want it to work, to happen, but there are still challenges. God, inspire our minds and our hearts. Grant unto us the strength. Help us to do it, to make it happen, great God Almighty, as we give you thanks and glorify you. We thank you, we bless you, we lift you up, we honor you. And we ask you to have your way in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray and we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So God bless you. Take care, brothers and sisters, all my father's children. Until we meet again, God's willing. Um, let's keep praying for each other. Let's keep trusting the Lord. And let's move to get our relationship together. It's very important. God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.